not too good at the history of books. How do you know the history of books are valid? Uh -huh. That's the question I'm going to ask a non-Christian. I know how to answer that. I'm a Christian, ma'am. I'm asking a non-Christian how he knows that the reliability of historical facts are true or not true. I'm waiting for him to enlighten me. Bible is not historically true. I'll say that first. Okay, time. how do you know the Bible? Okay, since you don't want to answer any of my questions, I'm trying to even, I'm even giving you, I'm conceding. Okay. I'm just going along with your statements since you refuse to answer any of mine. Right. How do you know the Bible is not reliable? Well, I know that several parts of the Bible are reliable. For instance, Jesus lived because Cicero how do you know wrote that? about it. Cicero, who was a Roman politician, wrote about Jesus' crucifixion. So Jesus how do you know that Cicero lived? Because he wrote stuff down. So everything that's written so, so everything that's written down is reliable? Yes. Everything? Not everything, but the fact that it's written <laughs> down is history in and of itself. Okay, so here's a question that I have for you. When you read history, yeah. do, are you depending on the validity of your reason? No, I'm depending on the validity of my sources. When you look at your sources, are you depending on the validity of your reason? Well, there's this thing called cross-referencing, and I'll show I'll When you cross-reference, do you, you use your reason to do that? Yeah, I do. How do you know your reason is valid? Uh, let me guess, you're going to say because God uh, made my reason valid. If you want me to answer the question for you, I'm asking you. Uh, How do you know your reason is valid, sir? My reason is, well, okay. Yeah, it's a simple you, question. You, you find out if your reason is valid if your results are valid. But that's, doesn't that presume you're going to use your reason again? Dude, this argument's so fucking stupid. You're so fucking stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Another, another postmodern... Uh, I'd only work something, but thank you. Thank you. So here's another uh, non-Christian who is not able to validate the reliability of his reason, and therefore he's unwilling to validate his worldview. He can't. Because the minute you reject God, you renounce knowledge. And when you renounce knowledge, you cannot make a knowledge claim like you are an SO, whatever you want to call me. <laughs> you know, you're, you're the worst person that ever lived. Well, you can't make that statement if you renounce knowledge, unless you're willing to say that statement is actually a meaningless statement, which in that case, why did you even make the statement if it's meaningless? See, this is what happens when you reject your maker. God gives you over to a futile mind. And week after week, young students like this, who have, you know, many objections to the Christian worldview, uh, have proven it to me year after year. And we've spoken before. So, do you want to take another stab at it? I mean, I think I can try as many times as you want, but if you live in ignorance like you do, you just won't change. Is, not, you just so is it true that I live in ignorance or not? Podium and you just speak at me, but you're never willing to listen to what I say? I well, listened I to that young man the whole time. He wouldn't answer any of my questions. Because you never, you like to use these big words and confuse people and actually anger them so they make mistakes. I'm actually using so pretty they, simple words. I mean, you, you are at a college, right? I mean, this is not a not kindergarten. An English major, man. What's that? Not an English major. Well, neither am I, but this, you don't have to be an English major okay, to so be able to, an, to, to answer the question, how do you know your reason is valid? I mean, is that, I mean, that's said, not exactly that quantum that physics. Christianity, I don't know the truth. Well, I know you're on a podium. I know you're on the... Oh, no. And you know what I'm going to tell you, right? No, I that's, that's based on the validity of your senses. How do you know your senses are valid? Is that just my knowledge I can assume that they're correct? So basically you're begging the question. You're saying my senses are valid because... Anything. Yeah, you are. The, the logical fallacy is this. I know my senses are valid because my senses are valid. That's not an argument. That's not a. That's, you that's say not logic a, when it comes to the, how the Bible is true. Well, the you Bible were, is true because the Bible is true. That's what you always say. No, sir. That's not at all what okay, I so what, what, I, what I try to say. Well, first of all, I'm trying to establish that according to your non-Christian worldview, uh -huh. you don't have the basis either to affirm or deny Christianity. You first have to abandon your worldview because you don't have a working epistemology. That is a big word, and it just means a theory of knowledge. You are not able to substantiate your theory of knowledge. Okay, so and with because your Christian of world view, and, yeah. With your Christian worldview, yep. show me how the Bible is valid on it being the Bible itself. Well, I can give you the I can give you the answer to that, but that assumes that you've adopted a different worldview. I'm you a question, man, but you won't give me the answer. Give me the answer. My answer is maybe too sophisticated for you then, because all I'm saying is that no. is that according to your world. I'm trying to answer it, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm being as truthful as possible and telling you that 
once you reject knowledge or the possibility of knowledge, any answer I give you, it assumes that you're using a different worldview. How am I rejecting something if you're not even giving me the answer? No, what I'm saying is that you really want to know what you have to say that you have to say. No, I no, sir. Well, there's sure in a Christian worldview, my answer is about to make sense. The, the Bible is true for two reasons. Number one, the impossibility of the contrary. Number two, because of an internal and external critique of the Christian worldview. That's it. Because without God, you couldn't know anything at all, and you just proved it to me. You keep saying it. You keep, you keep getting mad, but you can't get out of it. You can't prove a negative. What's that? You can't prove a negative at all. It's saying without light. Okay, no, you can't prove a negative or a positive in your worldview because you rejected God. And therefore, the only thing you can do is stand here and say, I know that I know for I know so that you for, know for a fact there's God. Of course. Okay, so I'm a Christian. Without, okay, 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 no. <laughs> you know that. We're going without that. We're going without that. What do you mean without, without that? Going, going without what? Without, without God, what would be different about the world? With, well, I'm proving it right now that without God, you don't have the basic foundation for meaning, morals, and beauty. You have no basis for aesthetics, for philosophy, or for morality. You are lost without God. And I've been here 10 years talking to atheists and agnostics like my friend here who reject biblical Christianity, and every single time the result is the same. When you reject God, you do not have the basis for knowledge. And once you re re reject knowledge, knowledge claims are absurd. When, once you say, we can't know anything for certain, anything that's about to come out of your mouth is an absurdity. I didn't say nothing is for certain. I'm what is for certain then? Without God. You're on a truth. You're, you're on a podium. That and, is a truth. Is, and it I, not, is it not true that you're on a podium speaking to me? That would only make sense in a Christian worldview. How is it? Okay, wait. Because I in a non-Christian worldview, you know how do you know you're... Yeah, I'm going to ask you the same question again. Right. Sir, without appealing to your senses, right, how do you know your senses are valid? You know, there are a lot of people that think they see things that they don't really see. You know where they're at? They're, they're in padded rooms with laying on their back with a needle in their back. There's a lot of delusional people that think they see something. So I'm delusional because I don't believe in some... You can say that, but you have to come up and prove it. Omnip omnipresent force in the world, and you say that's crazy, I'm delusional for not believing that. No, I, I'm not... Because that's a very, no, that's no, a very sir, large claim. Do you, no, not, do my you friend. not agree that God so let me, is a very powerful thing? And it, he let me try to qualify it a little bit better, okay? Right. And, I'm, and, and I don't mean to confuse you, but I also do not want to compromise the Christian position. Because the Christian position is very simple. Without God, we are lost. And we don't have the basis for meaning, morals, and beauty. In other words, we do not have the basic epistemology to make sense of our lives. We are epistemically lost, frustrated. We, we are frustrated in our ability to know anything for certain once we reject our Creator. Because we are not infinite. We don't know everything. We can't validate every single truth claim. And so we either have to have revelation from somebody that does, or we have to be that person ourselves. I have a question. So yep. how long has Christianity been present in this world? Like Since the dawning of time, since the creation of Adam. So Mesopotamia, Samaria, they, they practice Christianity? Adam was a Christian. I mean, I don't know what to say. No, 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 no. I'm asking you a question. Mesopotamia, all those first civilizations, did they practice Christianity? You're well, now you're asking me a different question. Okay, no, man, come you on, ask you the question. The first civilization, did they practice Christianity? Did you say <laughs> yes, the early, the show, early. Me, show me the first time yeah. Christianity has been recorded practicing past the already established timeline of history. I try to tell you. So the first people created, Adam and Eve, I believe were Christians because they walked with God and they knew God and they worshiped the true and living God. They worshiped the same God that Abraham worshiped, that Jesus worshiped, that I worship. They worship the same God. And therefore, we could say that categorically, Adam and Eve, the first humans that ever walked the face of the earth, mm -hmm. believed in the Christian God. It's that simple. Now, if you have categorical fallacies in your head, like, oh, unless they use the word Jesus, they were not Christians. That's absurd. Because Abraham didn't use the word Jesus, but Jesus insisted that Abraham 
knew him. So you believe that actually like humanity started from two people alone, right? Of course, I'm a okay, Christian. Okay, no, no, it's not that. Okay, so going along, they I had, believe the Bible. They had, they had kids, correct? You believe that science is still applicable, like general reproduction science is still applicable in this scenario you're making? Yes. Okay, so they had kids. Two had more kids. They either had kids with their own kids, or the kids had kids with each other. Yeah, they, they, of course. They, at, at first. So God is okay with incest. Where there was no law, it was permitted as a positive law for a time. But then it was prohibited in order to preserve the human race in the best possible way. So God permitted incest prior to God making it a, a violation of His will. The Bible says there is no sin where there is no law. Next question. What? Well, that's the so answer. It's okay because at this time, huh? like beforehand, it's okay to have sex with your sister and cousin. All and if you and if you look at the genealogies of the Bible, if you look at the genealogies of the Bible, it's not very long be before before the original before the hold on a second. It's not very long before in the Bible before people do not have to marry close relatives. You know, it says Adam and Eve have many other children after their first initial children. So you didn't have to marry your first cousin or something. Okay, no, but are you aware of like... That's all answered in the genealogies of the Bible, but the genealogies of the Bible don't make sense in your worldview because you reject the possibility of knowledge. So I just ask you, do, do, the, do my sci do scientific views still apply? How do you know the scientific view is correct if you don't know if there's absolute yes, truth? And you said it applies. Yes, because I'm a Christian. I have a category for things like science and the relativity of nature and the uniformity of nature and the laws of physics and the laws of logic. Those things make sense in a Christian worldview because that's the way that God wired the world. But as a non-Christian, you tell me, as a non-Christian, where does the law of logic come from? Where does the law of morality come from? How, does, how, does, how did we go from non-conscious okay. things Let me to ask conscious things? Are you aware of extinction events in gene pools? Uh, are no. you aware to a certain extent that when a population is reduced, they have the same gene pool and so that will just be recycling and there won't be a viable population? Okay. But this doesn't apply in your... It doesn't because we have the genealogies in the Bible. So it's magic. It's magic. We have all the historical documents. They go back to the original man and woman. But does it happen anymore? What do you mean, does it happen anymore? I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. We can't reproduce about. a whole population of individuals anymore. Well, how do you know that? Because, man, it's true. They will well, die. you have to understand. They will die out. Oh, of course. Well, then you, that's because of your, you didn't read the Bible but carefully. You, you, you did not read the Bible carefully book. enough because in the it's Bible, true. we are told that Adam lived to be 930 something years old. So, in Where is that record written other than the Bible? No, it's in the Bible. I don't. I is don't. It other than the Bible, man. Where is that record? No, so it's, people live no, it's not. Years? It's not other than the Bible. And I have no reason. To, I have no reason to be compelled to trust other historical documents outside of the Bible. See, your question assumes the Bible cannot be admitted as evidence. I reject that notion. I think it can. There's no reason not to. Why can the Bible? No, the Bible has shown incredible I'm saying, tenacity I'm not the over, Bible over history. Evidence. I'm saying the Bible cannot be evidence just because it established itself as evidence. It is to us because it's the Word of God, because it's axiomatic. It's self-evident. Without it, you couldn't know anything at all. And that's why we're back to square one. Without Christianity, you're stuck where you're at. Saying things like, I know this about history, and this about history, and this about science, and that about morality, but I don't believe in absolute truth, and I don't believe in absolute morality. Okay, so <laughs> That's agree. called a self-contradiction. Let's agree with something. So earlier, when you were uh, talking with that one other individual in the white shirt, you asked him, how do you know that anything is written is true? Uh, yeah. How do you know the Bible is written? It's written. Because of the Christian worldview. I mean... But without it, you couldn't know anything at all, which you've proven to be time and again. No, you're trying to give me the Christian worldview with the Bible, but I can't understand the Bible without a Christian worldview. No, when you're talking about the old, when you're talking about ultimate commitments within a worldview, every worldview will have to necessarily will have to so bear. When you're trying to establish a worldview, by necessity, it will manifest a level of circularity. In other words, if you say I'm an empiricist. 
but I am actually committed to rationalism in order to prove empiricism. No, no, well, then you're no longer an empiricist, you're a rationalist. No, I hear what you're saying. So if I were to say, I'm a Christian, hold on, if I were to say, I'm a Christian, but in order to substantiate Christianity, I believe in evolution. Well, I would no longer be committed to the basic Christian worldview. I would now be committed to a scientific worldview. You see what I'm saying? It's very simple. So it's like saying this, I'm an atheist. But in order to prove atheism, I first have to operate as an agnostic. Well, then you're an agnostic, you're actually not an atheist. You see what I'm saying? Presuppositions work that way. That's called the transcendental method of reasoning. Your basic presuppositions govern your worldview. And so if your basic presupposition is that you can't know anything at all, that will govern your entire epistemology. I mean, if I, if I believe that, I wouldn't be paying all this money for education, I would I? No, you actually do, like most students here, even though they can't account for anything, they still go on acting as if as if they do. Well, hello. I, I'm hello? not really here to debate, I'm just here to ask a couple questions. Okay. Uh, what sect of Christianity are you? I'm a Christian, I'm uh, Baptist, I'm Reformed. Baptist? So I, I, be, I, follow the, I follow the Protestant re, uh, Reformers, guys okay. like Calvin, Zwingli. And, and uh... I this is going to seem like an attacking question, but it's more of a question about curiosity. Yeah. How do you justify the great genocides, like Mao Zedong, Stalin, Hitler? What are you talking about? Just what do like, you mean, how do I justify them? Just in the... Like, I, I don't. Mean, you don't justify them. So would you just say that in the great plan they were just... would justify... I, I, sir, I don't know what you mean by that. Oh, you're that asking me why God would permit it? Yes. That's oh. Right. Okay, so the question you're asking is called theodicy. The question of God and evil, right? So why does God allow evil things to happen? And the answer to that question is because of the good that he will bring for his own glory. So all evil happens for his glory, ultimately. So as uh, like evil happens, so Yeah, so like, like for example, the greatest evil that ever happened on the face of the earth is the cross of Jesus Christ. When sinful man took the Holy Son of God and crucified him and murdered him, that was the worst evil that ever transpired on the face of the earth. Because Jesus, unlike all of us, all of the rest of humanity, Jesus was sinless and holy and innocent. He had never committed any sin, and yet we murdered him like a like a sinner, like a we, we crucified him like he was a murderer. Okay, and so the greatest evil ever committed was against Jesus Christ, the Holy, his name, he's even called the Holy One. And when that happened, God ordained it for his glory. And uh, do you believe in the Great Flood? I do. Uh, and when do you believe Jesus will come? I don't know. Uh, how will we know? Uh, when it's, how will we know when he comes? Yes. Well, the Bible says that it will be uh, it will be an unimaginable apocalyptic day of judgment. So when Jesus comes, in other words, it will be too late. And uh, will you be saved? By God's grace, yes. And will I be saved? I don't know. Are you a Christian? Uh, no. Then no. Okay, so no Christians will be anybody that's not Christian will be saved. Is that what you're saying? I mean, this is the Bible. What it teaches is that you have to be a Christian to go to heaven. Do you not know that? No, I'm, I grew up Catholic. I know. You grew up Catholic? Interesting question, but once again, you know, when we get into more of a philosophical discussion of worldviews, I always get into this conversation with people, and it's the conversation is like this. How do you know Christianity is true? And my answer is very simple. The impossibility of the contrary. You could not want better proof that something is true that if you try to deny it, you actually assert it. So my argument is that atheism presupposes theism. That is my argument. Let me try to illustrate it for you. Aristotle was asked, how do you know that the law of non-contradiction is valid, is true? You know what his answer was? Try to deny it. So in other words, if you come up here and you try to deny the law of contradiction, you actually have to use the law of non-contradiction to deny it. And in the same way, if you come up here trying to deny biblical Christianity, you actually find yourself standing on the foundations of biblical philosophy and epistemology 
and the whole basis of reason like a Christian. You know, everybody here lives like a Christian. Everyone. You don't give him glory if you're not a Christian, but everyone here lives like a Christian. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, um, so I fully support your God-given right to evangelize. I think that's beautiful. I wanted to know about your legally given right to evangelize. Do you have permits with you and you? Do you have them with the No, ma'am. Free speech doesn't need for, uh, a permit on oh, this property. Okay, because when I called the police on you, they told me that you have um, like permits to be here. I'm not yeah. attacking you. I except just for this area. Yeah, except for this area. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we used to get a permit on campus so that we can preach on campus. Um, and they kept shortening the time that we could preach. Basically, all this, the rules changed as soon as we started getting permits to preach here. But you see what I'm saying? Once you deny the possibility of knowing things for certain, when you say Christianity is not true, how do you know that for certain? You need any so without God, what we're saying is the okay, Bible, right, the Bible teaches will. us very, very easily. The Bible says without God, we are without hope without knowledge and without meaning there's no purpose to life if you re if you once you reject god why are you here so the bible would say without god you don't know where you came from you don't know who you are and you don't know where you're going you are lost so our whole existence is meant to you're back down. yeah i'm back i let the guy go you know trying to be uh what, you went over to what like a huddle or something <laughs> <laughs> do you now know why you can know things for certain? Do you now? Do you, can you now give us a, a way that you know that your senses are valid? But you'll disagree with me because I don't establish it with your Christian. How do you know that your reason is valid? How do you know that you're not delusional? I'm pretty functional in, in my in society. So Saying that you're functional is, a, is actually a logical fallacy. It's called begging the question. So I'll ask you again. How do you know that you're not delusional that your reason is valid? So, so on the basis of your answer, I know you said it kind of low so people could hear you, but you said you're not sure. No, I'm, saying, I'm asking you to explain to me, like, how is that operating in your worldview in my delusion? What way is it operating? Um, what do you mean without operating? No, no, no. What I'm saying is that because you don't have a Christian worldview, once again, you do not know why the words coming out of your mouth are meaningful in the first place. So everything you're about to ask me or that you're about to say, according to your worldview, my friend, mm -hmm. is meaningless. Don't you agree? No. Okay, tell us again, because I think we all missed it. How is what you're about to I say meaningful? My words and my views and who am I as a person makes me any less just because I refute your any less person, what? Your view, any less what? Any less of a person or any less valued than how you are. Like, how, no, am no. I, how am I where it's less of value just because I don't accept your Christian worldview? No, no, no. It, it's because when you reject the Christian worldview, you, said my you do not... Nothing because I don't base it on your worldview. Yeah, according to your worldview, your words are meaningless. They are irrational, they're meaningless, um, and... You and, say that, I'm saying otherwise, so... Well, I know that you're saying otherwise. See, here's the reality. You ready for this? You're trying to dictate my worldview. It's like you're saying this is your worldview. You're just assuming it. You don't know how exactly how op I operate. I'm asking you, how do you operate? But you're not even giving me answers. Well, what's wrong with dictating your worldview? You keep telling me mine's false. I'm asking you questions of why it's true and why is mine false, but you're not getting answers. I'm trying answers. to explain it to you. You won't listen. Because you're saying Once it's again, false because it's not my worldview. I'm like, what is the difference? Other than the fact that I just think it's crazy to believe that some metaphysical power created us so we live our entire lives on our knees just... The answer is this, are you ready? You have a frustrated epistemology. Now that is the technical answer to the question. Now, should you like the answer? That's a, I mean, I don't expect you to like, I like it. like the definition of the <laughs> you don't have, Yeah, you don't have a functioning, rational epistemology. Epistemology is a theory of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you take philosophy, one of the things you study is epistemology. Epistemology is a branch of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the, word, the word epistemology literally means a study of knowledge. So how do you know the things that you know? What I'm saying is that without the Christian worldview, you can't. Because the best thing that you can say is, I know things because I know things. But that's a logical fallacy. That's called begging the question, and it's no path to truth. It's certainly no path to objective truth. Sitting right there, the person who murdered your loved one or whatever has an actual evil act.
been committed, yes or no? How do you define it? That's the question I'm going to ask you. I'm a Christian, remember? You should know how I define evil. Okay, let's not go with evil, but was it against the law? And was it, like, was it... Hmm. Wow, so you're sitting there, and someone has murdered your loved loved one, and you don't even know if that's actually evil, what took place. Well, because I'm trying to structure my question, because I know exactly you're going to say, how do you... No, you too, it? ma'am. Come on up and I tell us the same wrong. thing then. I know it's wrong. I know it's evil. Wait, wait, okay. No. Is it really wrong, or is it just wrong in our society or in that courtroom? But is it not actually wrong? Like, in other words, we're asking a transcendental question. You know what that means? In other words, it's a question that rises above the functional level or the pragmatic level, it's actually what's true objectively. Okay, so if you're going along with that logic, like saying, yeah. like, not basing it on a law or anything, I would say yes, because it would make me think yes, like what? it, it yes, was evil, because it's abhorrent to me thinking of it, of someone Wait, I know dying. It's evil to you, that's subjectivism, that's not, that's not objective morality. See, this is where a really basic uh, study of philosophy will help. Because when you say things like, to me, it's abhorrent, or I don't like it personally. Well, you know, now flip that around. Maybe you like something personally. A pedophile personally gets pleasure out of what they're doing. That doesn't make it right. Right? That does not make it right. You see what I'm saying? That's subjectivism. Okay, so God, subject- God authorized or allowed incest to a certain extent. We already- because God allowed it at a certain point, it should be allowed now? No, sir. God has already put his, revealed his laws to society. And his, his moral law has already been revealed such that we can know that we no, la- we no longer are going back to an Adam and Eve situation. We're not transitioning into the beginning of a new humanity, okay? So, but back to your dilemma, don't you see the dilemma that you're in? Not really. The most basic, fu- you don't? So you're telling me, I really, I really, I sir, really believe you're telling me. Room in that scenario, I think my um, testimony You know, one of these days, me. if you become a father, and you're sitting in the courtroom, and someone has harmed your child, are you ready to stand up in that courtroom and say, no actual evil has been committed here? I don't think so, sir. I think you will know that every fiber of your being will cry out for injustice, or for justice, at that point. You're back. Yeah, no. Every time, what's up? You have a question for me? Yeah, I actually do. Um, what's up? So, I was talking, you guys weren't here last week, but no, sir. I was talking to um, the people who were here, and uh, I just had a question for you. To I see don't know who you, that was. Yeah, I just had a question for you to see if you'd answer it differently. Um, do you, I understand that God is like above all, like morally, spirit, like everything, right? Like, God is the greatest when it comes to morality, right? But he knows everything that will happen, is happening, is going to happen forever, across time, across every universe, whatever, right? Is that true? I mean, you're, you're confusing several categories there about God. On the one hand, you're talking about his moral perfection. On the other hand, you're talking about his omniscience. Okay, well, is God all powerful? Yes, or no, right? Now you're talking about his omnipotence. Okay. Yes, God is all powerful. Okay. So if he's all powerful, that means he knows what's going to happen, what is happening. You what asked happen. me this last time. No, I didn't. Yes, this you did. You asked me this last time, and the answer is the same. God is sovereign, and we are not. Okay. Yes, sir. Right, and everything so. will work out for his ultimate glory. Okay. Now, we can either repent to our joy, mm-hmm. or we can rebel to our destruction. Okay. So, what about why did God... I don't know if you'd say that he was disappointed or whatever, but yeah. why did God cast Adam and Eve out when they ate the forbidden fruit? Because they broke his covenant that he had made with them in Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17. But didn't he already know that they would do it? Yes, he did. So why would he be disappointed? Even though God already knew, and I would even say God even decreed that he would do it, they still by the revealed law, and therefore he was bound to punish them. But he already knew that they would do it, so what's the point? He knew that they would do it, but he himself didn't do it in their place. That's like, they were still moral agents who committed a crime. Okay. And that's the end of it. But he already knew that they would do it. Does yeah. that make sense to me? Yeah, you want to just stop, repeat, pause, rewind, go over. It's the same thing. Why do you, why I don't do you know think, what else to tell you. Why do you think that he got upset when they ate the fruit, when he already knew that they'd do it? Well, 
we got upset in the sense that the Bible reveals God's actions in what's known as anthropomorphic language, which means the Bible conveys to us the way that God acts or responds in human terms so that we can understand his actions, right? It's not that God was on his throne and said, oh my goodness, they took of the forbidden fruit, what am I going to do now? No, God, God is not moved by what the creatures that he has created do, but at the same time, God has revealed his will to us, and he has to respond to the violation of that revealed will. Even if he decrees that that will is going to be violated, he himself is not the one who violated it. And that's where we have to end it. So there's a level of mystery that we will never know. Do you think Do you think we'll ever know it? Ever? I think we'll know more of it. I, I really want to know. Right, like, I think that's, like me watching, sure. that's like me watching, spoilers by the way, that's like me watching Star Wars, like over and over, realizing that Luke, or that Anakin is Luke's father, and then being surprised or shocked that Anakin is Luke's father. How many times have you watched Star Wars? I've watched it a couple times. Just a couple? I mean, I a couple times to know that like Anakin is Luke's father. <laughs> In other words, you're still amazed at the story, right? No. Oh, you're I not. Know what's gonna happen. Oh, so you're not a it's an old movie. you're not a true like Star Wars fan that you don't go to the theater dressed up and. I mean, like, I like watching the movies, and that's it. Like, <laughs> like that, that's what I mean. Right, right. I know that Anakin. Yeah. You know what's is amazing Luke's is the Bible gives us the last book of the Bible. It's called Revelation. Have you heard of that? Yeah. I have. It tells us how the world's gonna end. Uh huh. And even though the Bible tells us how the world's gonna end, guess what? We uh-huh. still love reading the Bible. Because even though God has decreed all things according to His glory, that does not mean that there's still some dramatic interest involved. There is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Even though He is absolutely sovereign. Mm-hmm. He is sovereign, we are not. Yeah. So if you're looking for some sort of autonomous free will, where man has free will to the level of God, you're not going to find it. Why not? Because we're creatures and He's the Creator. But he already knows everything that's going to happen, so what is it supposed to matter? Does it matter that I have free will? It matters, free because it, all, it, it matters because it all tends towards his glory. And we are commanded in Scripture to do what's right in his eyes. And if we use the sovereignty of God as an excuse not to obey God, then you'll answer to God for that. But he already knows, so what's the point? Well, you can live a fatalistic worldview if you'd like. That's not the biblical worldview. That's why I said that even though God is sovereign, He still commands us to live in the way that's pleasing to Him. Okay. You haven't, maybe somebody else, you got a big line here. Thank you for your question. The microphone is not for Christians, by the way. The microphone is for non-Christians. I'm not here to talk to Christians. So if you are a Christian, I ask you to have integrity and not come to the microphone, because I'm not here to preach a sermon to Christians, I'm here to talk to non-Christians. Now, if you refuse to abide by that rule, and you come up here claiming to be a Christian, and you actually reveal yourself not to be a Christian, as so many people do, because you've commenced to cursing me out or something like that, well then maybe the microphone will actually work for you after all. You have a question for me? Hi. Did you guys bring your popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> so you said the microphone was for... Yeah. What's that? You said the microphone was for non... Non-Christians. non-Christians. Yeah, I'm not here to, to, to fellowship with other Christians. We could do that at church or at Starbucks or something. Say one thing. Are you a Christian? The microphone does not work for people who claim to be Christians either because... I don't, if you want to preach, get your own microphone and you can preach to people. That's okay, unless you have a question for me, the microphone won't work. Okay, do you have a question for me, ma'am? If you don't, then it doesn't work, because then... Yeah, you go ahead and preach. Now, somebody can come and ask a question if you're a non-Christian. Somebody have a question for me? Anyone? Okay, guys, exactly. See, I'm a Christian, but I will not respect the Christian's rules for the microphone. (laughs) That's not very Christian ethics, folks. But anyway, the reason why it doesn't work for Christians, like I said, is because I'm here for one simple reason, and that's to preach the gospel to non-Christians. Now, a lot of Christians will come here and tell you 
this guy is not a Christian because he's not loving and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't love you and, and love, 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 love. And isn't that so shallow, like, that some Christians, the only word in their head is the word love. When the Bible tells us, give a reason or an answer to every man that asks you the hope that is within you. And the Bible says, earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So, that's what I'm doing. So, I personally, um, I get very grieved that Christians would hinder the preaching of the gospel. They haven't read their Bible, apparently, because that's not something we should do. But the microphone does work for non-Christians. Yeah, it works. We're here, very, very simple, guys. We're here to talk about the Christian worldview. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people want, like, Joel Osteen Christianity up here. They want somebody to stand up here and say, hey, man, you're great. God loves you. You just keep living the way you're living. You're just going to be just fine. You know, God, he's your biggest, you know, fan on social media. You know, he, he follows you on Twitter and Facebook, and he watches all your YouTube videos. And, you know, he's just your biggest fan. That is just not what the Bible teaches, folks. You know, what the Bible teaches is that God is holy. And that a holy God is going to judge us when we die. You know, so you can either take her version of Christianity and the version of Christianity that people come out here and say, this is all wrong. God just loves you and that's all you need to worry about, which is a complete idolatrous picture of Christianity. You have to actually believe in the God of the Bible. I have a question. For you. Yeah. Okay, so you and I can both believe that the Bible says we need to be slow to anger and control our tongues, correct? Uh, you could uh, agree to that, sure. Anybody, an atheist could agree to that. Okay, but you know, um, just the Bible says we need to be slow to anger and control our tongues, correct? Of course. Okay, so when people come up and they ask you questions, are you coming from a place of love or a place of anger? Well, hopefully I'm coming from a place of love, but you would never know it because you can't judge my motives. Right, and you cannot as well judge if I'm a Christian or not. And I, judge actually, I can't can based on your profession. Speaking are you a Christian? Why, well, yes, I actually okay. am. But what will happen to yeah. people who die without Jesus Christ? Yeah, they will go to hell, you're right. Yeah, that's not a very popular yes. uh, okay. statement. Yes, you're right, it's not popular. Yeah. It's not popular for me. And it's if you love them enough, you would tell them, God right? God does not want them to go to hell. What's that? God wants them to go to heaven. God wants every single person in this world to go to heaven. Oh, well, that's not what the and Bible God does says. God not but... want us to be coming from a place of anger. Right. And speaking to people and telling yeah, I'll give you one more because I said it wasn't for Christians. Hell. I said it wasn't for Christians, so You're right. I'll give you a last word. Go ahead. Last word. All right. I respect that. Yep. I respect you for coming out here Thank you. and talking in front of this crowd. Last word. Wanna, last word. Yeah. You need to be more gentle with your words. Thank you. Anybody who's not a Christian want to talk on the microphone? Go ahead. Because I'll say it again, I'm not here to fellowship with Christians. I am here to talk to non-Christians about Christianity. If you genuinely are a Christian, then I am delighted that you're on your way to heaven. And praise God, and and one day we'll be able to fellowship. But right now, you are you are talking about a, being a Christian, but now you're being completely rude. You're getting in her way. I'm sorry. You said I couldn't speak as a Christian, but yet that's what you believe. Man, but you are hindering the preaching of the gospel. That's something no Christian would ever do. And a Christian would respect another Christian's wishes. Ma'am, if you were up here preaching and you say, don't talk on the microphone if you're a Christian, I would sit there in the spirit of Christ and respect your rule. Oh, really? To respect one another? No, to say, if you are a Christian, you don't speak. Uh, that is wrong. Oh no, that's not wrong. That's actually because a biblical. I'm, I'm following a, a biblical principle that tells us that Christians. Any Christian to do. The reason why I don't have Christians talk on the microphone because I don't want to fight with other Christians. We 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 can do that in private the way that we're told to do in the Bible. Even though most Christians, sadly, maybe they miss that part, but we're not supposed to argue in front of non-Christians, and many Christians don't know that biblical principle, and that is sad. Is there a non-Christian who has a question for me? Yes, sir. She was talking, but now she, ma'am, ma'am, what you're doing is not Christian. Okay, sir, you want to come on up? Be, if you could just grab that microphone and talk into it, we can talk. <laughs> if she'll let you. 
It, it takes a second. It takes it. Uh, there you go. Awesome. You know I turn it on. Come on. Oh, you talk, ma'am, sir. Talk to me, sir. Right. You have a question for me, not yeah, her. Yeah, I'm doing good. Right? I, I, yes, sir. Right, cool. Yep. So I wanted you to try to help me understand the concept of like the two different types of love that God has. I heard you talking about. Yeah, there's a benevolent, a benevolent, and a covenantal love of God. Right. right. Yeah. So. How does, explain to me covenantal love first. Please. Covenantal love is essentially salvific love. Okay. The love of self, the love that God has with people who are saved. That's cool. so And that's a special love. love. For the saved people. Correct. Okay. His children. Love is, is a general love, is a general love that he has for mankind as a creator. Okay, and so. For example, right now, you're not a Christian. Right. Since, okay, la no, since no, last no, time we talked, right? No, 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 no. But God loves you in the sense that He is allowing this beautiful sunshine yeah. to come down, and you can experience the beauty of the, the breeze. Kind of like the mercy of God, more or less. What's your favorite food? Uh, Mexican food, actually, like quesadillas. So God allows you to have the taste buds to relish wonderful things like quesadillas. Okay, cool. That's a very that's so very loving for food, God. Yeah. Being able to, breathe, to do that to love, rebels right now, that hate him. In general is God's so, love. there's the two loves. All right, cool. Yes, sir. So, love between a man and a woman, yes. right? That's, I mean, if they're huh? Christians, right? Like, that's, you know, both covenantial and benevolent. But if it's a non-Christian... Are you talking about marriage? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Oh, uh, okay. I don't really do that's that. actually a perfect illustration. Sure. I've actually done this when I'm actually officiating a wedding. Uh -huh. I'll turn to people and explain the covenantal love of God. I say, you know, there's a lot of wives in the in the in the room today, uh -huh. and I love all of you in one sense, right? right? But my wife is sitting here, and I love her in a special covenantal way, right. and I don't love the rest of you, yeah, or else I'd be in trouble. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So people, we we understand this category right. of a special love that we have for our wives or our husbands, right? Vice versa. So in the same way, God has a special love for those that will repent and believe in His Son who become children of God. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're either a child of God or a child of the devil. And that's the way that God sees it. So if I don't believe in God, then I automatically believe in the devil? No, no, no. You're a child of the devil because you do what He does. You, you okay. do what He does. Being a child of the devil is an inherently negative thing. Uh, well, if, you will end up in. It's just a perceptual thing, don't worry. You'll be in perdition like the um, devil, sadly. So, you'll go to hell. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, the love between a man and a woman, that covenantal love that's only capable because of Christ, cannot uh, exist in any other sort of gender form. Right? So, like, between no. a man and a man, that can't exist. No, sir. How? Oh. It's perversion. It's perversion. Me, well, okay, just help me understand, like. Because a violation of God's and glory and of God's law. How so? Because he's Because so God's law reflects. Person? Yeah, okay. because God's law reflects the love that Jesus has towards his bride, the church. And as a matter of fact, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 and following, yes. marriage itself is a reflection of the relationship that the church and, the, and, and Christ have, or Christ and his church, which, which he calls his bride. Mm -hmm. So that ecclesiastical relationship is reflected in the relationship between a man and a woman, okay. and like a bride and a bridegroom. There's not two brides and there's not two bridegrooms. So, like in God's view, um, I guess. So yeah, homosexuality is a perversion. Right. There's no ma no matter which way you slice so, it. I mean, I guess I'm trying to understand like. But so is everything else that violates God's design. Yeah. So. Like fornication. Um, or polygamy or polyamorous relationships or anything like that. It's right. all a perversion of because what God designed. I know it's very popular in our culture because right. I, it's ironic. I started the whole day off talking about Romans 1 and how Romans 1 tells us this is what happens to a culture when God gives it over to a debased mind. Number one, you have a sexual revolution, which we experienced in the 60s. Okay. We had a sexual revolution. Well, the Bible predicted like everything that's pretty much going to happen. No, sir. Well, hold on. I'm not talking necessarily about specific prophecy oh, okay. I'm not saying I'm not saying the Bible Romans 1 is predicting the 60s <laughs> I'm no, saying, saying that saying. I'm saying the 60s reflect what Romans 1 teaches oh. that when man rejects the Creator and on a cultural level sure, sure. the first thing that usually happens is a sexual revolution so an abandonment of just a strict you know uh, a family uh, a unit one man, one woman, holy matrimony, covenant of marriage with children for life, right? Okay. They reject that and then they adopt 
promiscuity, fornication, sex outside of marriage, all of that, right? Yeah. And then, according to Romans 1, what comes next is a homosexual revolution. That's the next level of the cultural moral decay. The Bible wasn't meant to predict these things, but it kind of is following an example of what would happen to humanity when certain things happen. Well, in a sense, it predicts it, but more than that, Romans 1 is just telling us this is what is going to happen yeah. when God, in His wrath, gives a culture over to their own debased thinking. Okay. And, after a, and after a homosexual revolution, then you have total sexual anarchy. I mean, where the culture, where the culture is no longer capable of stemming the tide of what's coming, right. like our culture is today. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, my goal here isn't necessarily to necessarily debate with you. My goal is okay. to get a better understanding of the world and Christianity. Um, so that's okay. why I'm always going to Any other so questions? I'm, yeah, I was actually going to switch subjects. So yeah. one thing that I always wonder is kind of like why God is like this perfect, complete being that needs nothing from no one, that has absolute knowledge of time and existence, needed to create a lower image of himself in the first place. For his glory. So, I mean, God, as his absolute being, needed outside reverence in order to... He did to, not need. Well, I mean, you okay, said right, it yourself. Right, he did yeah. not need, but he desired. The Bible says being God creates desired. us for his pleasure. Yeah. And for his glory. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in my mind, yes. if I'm in a place where I need somebody else to... I guess validate my existence. That's kind of a well. God a does. Place to be. Well, like, God does. You were created for His glory. If you if you don't live for God's glory, then you're He's basically giving you honey, and you're mm -hmm. eating sand. Right. I mean, but like, I wouldn't exist in the first place for one God, right? So. Well, that's what I would say. The first thing. Right. Right. But like, why? Why would God need to create other existences? Like, it doesn't do make mean? sense to me as something that's completely perfect, self-sustaining, that needs well, he is, he is perfect. He is, just he is self I mean, created something to worship him. <laughs> sure. It, it's no violation to the, uh, what's known as the aseity of God, right? What is, the, you uh, that? Yeah, the aseity of God is the doctrine that God needs nothing outside of himself. Right. It's from the Latin word ase, from yourself. Okay. So he needs nothing outside of self, yeah. right? And But it's no violation of the aseity of God that he, for his own pleasure, created a world in which he would enter into in the person of jesus christ redeem a people for himself and enter into a everlasting relationship with them that's something he did and when he did that he did it for the glory of his own name i guess why would i mean god could have also created a series of entities that are the, equal to yeah, him, the, that the, are the same the that glory of god the same thing. yes sir so I create something yes sir more. i'll answer it the same way but last time the glory of God is not a step to something else. It is the end of it. Yes, sir. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Do you have a question for me now? I have several. Okay. All right, so I'm here to ask questions. I'm not necessarily here to debate. Well, if you ask questions, I'm sorry if it feels like a debate, yeah, that's but I'm going to try to answer your questions. I'm here for you to answer my questions without mm -hmm. dancing around. Okay. So, my first question is, um, you claim you are Christian, correct? Like, that's like what you do, define yourself as, yeah? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, there are lots of different Christians with people that say they're Christian that have different philosophies, go to different churches, believe... Yeah. And kind of like a different thing than maybe you do. Sure. Are those people going to heaven? Or is it just like the exact philosophy that you believe? The Christian... The, or, like the, what takes a Christian... Sure. I've had this question a lot. Sure. Yeah. What takes a Christ, uh, Christian from being a Christian that's going to heaven and yeah. then a Christian that's going to Yeah, heaven? Christianity has maintained... A historical Christianity has maintained an orthodox body of doctrine from its inception. Mm -hmm. And the way that I would summarize that doctrine is through the doctrine of revelation, redemption, and uh, God. So, in other words, if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, I mean, I don't think you're a Christian. If you, if you think redemption or salvation is by works and not grace and faith, I would say you're outside of Christendom. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you reject the, the, the doctrine of God in the Bible, meaning that God is not does not consist of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then you're not a Christian. And if you look in the history of Christianity, these essential components of the Christian faith have been upheld all throughout the, the history of Christendom. And so you, you, sometimes you see it reflected in creeds, sometimes you see it reflected in councils, um, but going all the way back, that's what, Christi that's what historic Christianity believes. 
of people in the name of Israel. And, and to violate one of those principles, I think, puts you outside of the realm of orthodoxy, and then you become what's known as heterodox. You are other than orthodox. And so for 2,000 years, at least under the, the New Covenant, uh, Christianity has always maintained this body of doctrine. Okay, so it's the Orthodox Christians that are kind of more in your realm. Yes. Well, be careful there, because Orthodox Orthodox Christians mm -hmm. could refer to like the Orthodox Church, like Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Egyptian Orthodox. I'm talking about the word Orthodoxy just means like what's in keeping with true or sound doctrine. Yeah, I know. What right? Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that. Anyone that violates these essentials of the Christian faith is not a Christian. So, for example, Jehovah Witnesses. You go to Jehovah Witness and you ask them, are you a Christian? Yes, absolutely. Who is Jesus Christ? They would say, well, Jesus is a created being uh, like, an, like an angel. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. So, you have a different concept of God. Okay? okay. It's no longer Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three are one. It's now a strict... Uh, monotheism where there's only really God, Jehovah the spirit is not even a person for Jehovah Witnesses, he's like a principle or a force and then Jesus is not the son of God God incarnate, he's kind of like an angel, yeah. that is heresy that's okay. outside of biblical orthodoxy right, I think I understand your yep. position on that question my next question is, I actually have a question about a specific church I'm sure you've had many questions about I just wanted to see what your viewpoint and your belief system has to say about You mean the guys that stand out and yell at? Yeah, what do you think about their agenda? <laughs> it's non-Christian. Okay. Okay. Cool. Your way is the only perfect way. You follow the Orthodox teachings of the Christian faith. See, because uh, for example, I have there's a employee here at UNT. He's a good friend of mine. He comes here and he'll listen to the preaching. He's Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. I'm Baptist. We disagree on some really fundamental things, but we do not disagree on any essentials of the Christian faith. Okay. We might disagree on the mode of baptism, we might disagree on liturgy, we might disagree on some points of ecclesiology, like how to run the church, but we believe in the essentials. The Bible is the word of God, you're saved by grace through faith, the God, God consists of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. We, we don't deviate on essentials. So I could say that, I could say that with an evangelical, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, I could say that with a you know uh, you know different, different a Methodist as long as they're not you know as long as they haven't abandoned biblical orthodoxy. Okay, and I just like want a definition from you. Is that cool? If I just of what? Out, shout out a word. The word cult. Like, how would you define that word? Well, cult has a couple of different words. The word cult can just mean religious, uh, or it could just speak of that which is ritual. <laughs> so, like for example, in Christian theology, we even use the word cult to refer to what Israel was doing in the theocracy, right? Um, but that doesn't mean something like a cult, like yeah. <laughs> Westboro Baptist cult, yeah, yeah, yeah. or, you know, <laughs> you know, so yeah. So you're saying it can be used for a lot of different things. Jim right? Jones cult or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you I have pseudo-Christian cults, and then yeah. you have cults that are not necessarily pseudo-Christian, they're just cults. So, mm -hmm. for example, I would consider any sort of um, any sort of witchcraft or occultic, which Denton is full of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very prevalent here. Okay. Yeah. And I would say that's a cult if you belong to, say, Wicca or something like that. Gotcha. But you're not a pseudo-Christian cult. Okay. And uh, <laughs> I just also wanted to get your um, opinion on the separation of church and state in the United States. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain degree where it has to be separate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to know, and like, Jesus how far are you... Yeah, Jesus took the sword out of Peter's hand. Right? He didn't put the sword into Peter's hand. He didn't say, fight for me. And Jesus told Pontius Pilate right before his trial, he told him, if my kingdom were of this earth, then my servants would fight. Mm -hmm. But my kingdom is not of this world. Okay. And so the church has limits. You see what I'm saying? Now, that doesn't mean that Christians don't have a, don't have a, uh, a theory of just war. We do. And self-defense. We do. I believe the Bible teaches self-defense, but I don't think we can take matters in our own hands and gotcha. engage in vengeance or violence or vigil vigilante type of activity. Yeah, and I just have one more question, then I'm going to let these guys okay. go ahead and get speaking. So, um, I don't, I'm don't. i sure you've heard of um, the issue where it, uh, Ten Commandments, um, 
uh, like statue was outside of a courthouse and so the Church of Satan argued that to have that up they would like to put up their own statue or have it taken down to have yep. kind of an equal playing field. Yep. I just want to know like your opinion on that. Like is that okay? I mean I, I know think you're seeing the limits of democracy, right? I think you're seeing the limits of democracy and pluralism in a society that will not be able to maintain its pluralistic identity without engaging in self-destruction. So unless our country engages in some degree of church and state, you know, identity, and if it just becomes a strict pluralistic society, then it's only a matter of time before, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but you wouldn't like protest to necessarily have it taken down. You're saying if my thing is up, you know, I don't agree with that other thing, but because of the way that our country is set up and our laws are, yeah, I don't think the I'm state, not going to fight against it. Yeah, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think the state should be the one, you know, that is dispensing uh, religious truth. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good day. Because once they start doing it, well, then they can determine how you do it. Anybody else have a question? Non-Christian? Please. I know that's hard for some Christians to swallow, but... <laughs> I was Lift up the mic. You're calling her. There you go, my man. I was talking to earlier yeah. about objectivism and how you were kind of saying, like, without Christianity, you wouldn't think murder was bad or certain things like that. Well, I asked the gentleman here that if, because he rejects Christianity, and something terrible happened to his family in his home. He's sitting in a courtroom. Can can he say in his worldview that actual, like in other words, has an actual evil been done? Has 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 actual right and wrong been violated, or is it just for me it's been violated? You see what I'm saying? So I would say if I'm sitting in a courtroom, forget the courtroom, but if somebody murders my family member. I would not hesitate to say that person committed actual evil. It's not just that it was against me or I find it to be wrong, but it's transcendently wrong. It's you absolutely know, wrong. In, it's wrong, but it's just not evil? Like, what is evil? It's a violation of God's law, so it's evil. That's how I would interpret it in a Christian worldview. So what I'm saying, about, if you're not a Christian... We wouldn't have gotten to the point where we can define exactly. murder is wrong. We can't. I disagree with that. Okay, so how, why is so it wrong? If you and I put you in a society where murder was legal, like murder just happened everywhere, how would you feel as an individual in that society? Yeah, but you're always reduced to hypotheticals because your situation actually doesn't exist well, that's in reality. Like, Every civilization we've ever unearthed has what the Bible calls a conscience. Yeah, the American Indians understood murder was wrong. Exactly. Yeah. And even the ancient pagans of the... Because even it's inherent. The, Christianity has nothing to do with it. We understand No, it has everything to do with it. Because the Bible tells us that the work of the law of God is written upon our heart. God's law instructs us not to lie to our parents. Not to lie at all. Well, I feel like that's kind of a cop-out. Like you kind of just claim, like, okay, like, let's say... Race bad. You just get a claim Christianity is the reason why race bad. No, Even it's obviously just like already know why like, race bad. No, obviously, you know, I come up here and I say that we are in the we're in the conflict of worldviews. We are in the battle of worldviews. And so if you're saying, well, it's not owing to biblical Christianity that people have a conscience, okay, so then what is it owing to? Why we have a conscience? Yes, sir. Over decades of us living in society with each other and trying to figure out ways to coexist with one another in like the most easiest way. So then, how come people have you? Like, so then, why have people murdering each other? So then, why have people developed? Better if we weren't all murdering each other. And that gave rise to a universal moral code, like you shall not murder. Like really, slowly we developed societies. Like we started out <laughs> just as hunter gatherers, roaming tribes, just killing each other all the time. Yeah. And then slowly, through sociology, we developed. Civilizations. So then you do not believe it's ultimate right and wrong. Uh, so one day, one day society may discover the benefits of pedophilia. Many societies already do. I mean, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia said it is a right, according to Sharia law, for any religious Muslim to have a child bride. Again, that's religiously based. Okay, so what? In your worldview, there's no ultimate right and wrong. So if you have a religious basis for pedophilia, then do it, right? Well, then they're hurting those people who are victims. Not of in their society, sir. And who are you to judge them? That's the that's the conclusions 
that their society has come to, just like Hitler. Look at that system, and there's so many flaws with that system. You have like children being abused. They don't believe that. That's a judgment call that you're making, and what they would say is that's arbitrary. Well, the fact that there's people suffering on that means it's not correct. If there's people suffering, see, this is the problem in philosophy that's called truth in many minds. Because what's going on in your brain is not what's going on in the Muslim's brain, it's not what's going on in the Hindu's brain, it's not what's going on in the pedophile's brain, it's not what's going on. So, who arbitrates between all conflicting worldviews if there's no ultimate transcendent law? You can't. That's the meaning of arbitrary. Well, what I'm saying is those people are suffering, and if there's somebody suffering... Sir, but suffering is your opinion, that's not their opinion. If the sure, people might want be... to be in that system, they're being pushed into like pedophilic relationships yeah. they don't want to be in. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's exiomatic to you, but not to them. And and let's say, as many sociologists are predicting, that Islam is going to eventually dominate the world in some way. And let's say it becomes a predominant Sharia law becomes predominant in the West. Fast forward two hundred years. Have you been to England lately? It's transformed completely. I was in London in 2000, the year 2000. I was in London, and downtown London by Big Ben, Muslims do 24-7 evangelism. With line after line after line of booths where they're passing out Quran and Sharia literature. And if you go there now, there are some, pro there are some cities in London, in England, that you won't even recognize anymore. I mean, just Google it. No go zone, Europe. Mus no go zone, Muslim zones in Europe. They're everywhere. They're they're entire neighborhoods. You're not. You you, won't, you don't even feel safe going to. The cops won't even go into that. So fast forward 200 years. This has happened just in a few decades. Fast forward 200 years, two centuries. Where are we going to be as a civilization? Again, like I'm saying, this is a religious point. Like you can't just claim Islam is the only religion that has problems. Every religion has problems. I'm using Islam. Is no, no, no. I'm using Islam as an example. Religions. Well, take any other religion. I mean, take Buddhism for example. They're I'll Catholic. Take Christianity. Well, biblical Christianity would tell you that it's wrong, and we have a reason why but it's wrong. People still do it. People still murder still what? in the name of Christianity. There's still problems in violation to Christianity. Well, they not in the keeping, book as their not in keeping with Christianity. No, sir. No, no, no. There's no verse in the Bible so that tells you. So how can God wrote a different kind of conscience than the one that you go by? So it's okay for them to murder, like, let's say, because they're not regenerate. What? Because they're not regenerate. They're not saved. They're not Christian. But they claim they're Christians. So and what? They, that, the Pope, God wrote a different the Pope kind of can, on your heart listen, and man, a different kind on their The heart. Pope claims to be Christian. That doesn't make him a Christian. I don't believe he is. Why not? Because he violates the teaching of Scripture. He believes salvation is by works, not by grace or faith. But doesn't didn't God write the same consciousness on his heart that he wrote on your heart? Yeah, but there's limits to the conscience. We have revelation to inform our conscience. Our conscience can never dictate anything to us that contradicts the word of God. Actually, he doesn't. Actually, he doesn't. Actually, actually, he, doesn't. He, he, he reads a Catholic Bible that has introduced the Apocryphal books uh, in the Council of Trent in 1537. They added books to the Bible officially. So it's different. That's why I come up here. I do not identify with Catholicism. I believe Catholicism is a false religion. You mentioned earlier Methodists, right? And how they're not Orthodox Methodists. Many of them are Methodist. very liberal. Yes. Like so very liberal. They read the same book because yep. my parents were Methodists. They read the same yep. Bible as you, and they come away with a different different conclusion. That's right. So what makes your conclusion any more right than their conclusion? I think if they're able to validate it. Sure. You are. I think mine they is. have the same consciousness on their heart. Yeah, that's right. Like what makes so it boils down to an argument of exegesis. And I believe, for example, when you start. So then your own religion doesn't have its own objective truth within it so i think the bible when you interpret the bible and there's when you allow the bible to speak for itself i think it's pretty objective what it's saying especially on big issues like salvation the identity of who god is how, how you know whether or not the bible is the word of god you know a child can tell you what these things mean the bible actually speaks about second peter chapter three twisting the bible to your own destruction if you want so bad to make your church liberal and to start ordaining homosexual clergy, you will twist the Bible until you get there. Even though it says clearly in the Bible the guidelines for ordaining 
uh, officers of the church. Then how do you know you're not the one twisting it the wrong way and they had it right? Because I think I think that on two levels, mine is in keeping with historic Christian orthodoxy, so, and, and the theirs is you're not. Telling me, like, who am I to look at theirs and say it's wrong? Can I tell you who are you to look at their way of interpreting the Bible and saying it's wrong? Yeah, of course. And so what we would say is that again, so your excuse is just, well, I think I have it right because I'm more holier than you. No, sir, that's that's not that's not it at all. Uh, it would it would boil down to an argument of exegesis. And on top of that, also a historical argument of orthodoxy. And if you look at the Christian church for 2,000 years, um, we have a pretty clear body of doctrine of what is clearly orthodox Christian faith and what is not. And I think you can distill it down to three things, mainly three things. And I think I can make a pretty convincing argument for that based on, again, the church council, so the you creeds, the confessions. Are you just claiming, like, you say you're from the orthodox. What's accepted, what's right. acceptable. Because you follow the original orthodox, correct? Historic Christian orthodoxy. So that just means you were the first ones to do it. So no, sir, that's not what it means. That means that you are in the stream of historical Christianity. So whether you're Presbyterian or Baptist, or whether you're, you know, Methodist or you're Nazarene, and, and, and until you say things like, this is not God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, I believe, you know, we need to throw Joseph Smith in there. He's a God, too. I mean, obviously, for 2,000 years, the church has rejected that idea and has a standard understanding of the Trinity. For example, the Trinity is accepted Christian doctrine. That's nothing, that's not debatable anymore in any way. Neither is the identity of Jesus, neither is the means of salvation, and neither is the identity of God's Word. We know what the Word of God is. It's the Bible, Old and New Testament. And that's, and, and when you say, we have the Bible, but we also need the Book of Mormon, or we also need the Quran, or we also need, you know, Charles Russell's uh, writings for Jehovah Witnesses. Well, obviously, then you've I mean, violated Christian orthodoxy well, what to is your that? own destruction. Because my parents, I, I'm not Methodist, but my parents I, are Methodist, okay. and they're not of Orthodox Methodist. So what's the extra part of the Bible that they're adding that you have a problem with? Oh, I don't know. That's what I would say. It depends if they're, it depends if they're liberal. Do they ha have they gone to the point where they're so liberal that the Word of God is no longer the inspired Word of God? Are they so liberal that they are now ordaining homosexual Let's clergy? See. Is yes. that how liberal they are? Then yes. no, that, that's, then that's a violation of God's law. They also have women pastors. Is that a problem? That is a problem. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 why through be, 11. Why, does not, why doesn't God exist in women the same way he exists in men? Why? Like, why does God make a distinction? Like, why would God put more of himself in the men that allows them to talk in churches and not in the women? Well, the short answer to that is because he wants to, and who are you to question him? I don't want to do anything. Well, then, that's not an answer. Then you have to... What do you mean? He's God. That God your God. You have to prove that your God is the God that literally exists. For that to make sense. But you can't do that. Uh, sir, I've, I've already argued that the existence of the Christian God is based on the impossibility of the contrary. And that based on an internal and ex external critique of the Christian worldview, I believe Christianity has the best explanatory power of all worldviews. Well, then they could say, who are you? So you reject about? Christianity, right? Yes. Do you have a basis for knowledge? Yes. And how do you know what you know? Because I've lived my life. So that's a, that's a logical fallacy of begging the question. How do you know that you've lived your life? How do you know that this is, you know, there are really smart, powerful people that would deny that. Elon Musk, the creator of Tesla, recently said he's convinced that this is all a digital simulation of a higher... Uh, a higher life, some higher form of life or a higher being has digitally simulated everything that we experience and that this, is, this entire humanity has been a digital simulation. How do you know he's wrong? He, and he wasn't joking. And there are many people that agree with him. As we approach technological singularity, this is going to be the argument is that we do not know and we will not be able to distinguish between what is the singularity and what is reality. What is a simulation in somebody's, how do we know we're not an app on some alien smartphone out in the middle of nowhere? Well, I feel like that's just a cop-out, because then I can say, it's a cop-out, well, but it's a question. Because then I can just say, I can just make up my own religion, and Go then for I can't just prove it. Go for it, give so it a shot. Why does Christianity some people have tried throughout the years, it hasn't worked out for them, and you might want to try it. Go for it. If you want to believe in the flying spaghetti monster, I dare you. Go ahead, and once you develop your religion, come on back. Maybe I could believe it come on back, thoughts, and then we'll, we'll debate the merits the of the flying spaghetti monster. I mean, if that's the way you want. Well, if you want to face your soul about that, go for it. just as credible. No, it won't. is yours. Controls because like political movements, people's lives. 
I would say it informs, it informs the politics and it does control your life, as it should, because that's your worldview. I mean, what do you want it to do? So Christianity is just like it's a trinket on the uh, on your keychain. I mean, no. Following Jesus Christ is a it's an all for all proposition. You're all in. It's, it's, he is the master. You're the slave. He's the Lord. You're the servant. He he is God, and you are the creature. That's the way that it is. Do you understand the problems that can cause though if you believe something can that, that can't be proven? Okay, so then you live your life according so to that instead of like what's so. What do you think is the solution? Is? Secularism, atheism, agnosticism? No, I believe the solution is logic. What kind of logic? Well, what Christianity is not logical. No, you just said it was. What are you talking about? I just sat here and told you you're the one that violated the laws of logic. Because you beg the question when I ask you, how do you know knowledge? How do you know that your basis of knowledge is true? Well, like, how do you, how do you know, know anything for this? It's not true, so we're both wrong. No, absolutely not. Once you deny knowledge, you can't say something like we're both wrong, because now that's a knowledge claim. But I've never denied knowledge. I never said I don't know anything for certain. I do know things for certain because God revealed it to us in a way that we can know it. According to Deuteronomy 29, 29, God has revealed himself in such a way that we can know things for certain. But we we won't know everything. Any monster exists and it has as just much validity as your God. Go for it. Bring bring the evidence forth. Where is he? Where's it at? Where's yours? Well, oh, no, the Bible the Bible the doesn't Bible is a book. Yeah, that's it's a right. Book to me. That's right. It's papers. That's I'll right. go write a book myself. I'll go bring for it. Back it. Here. Do it. So then, if I bring that book back here, will it makes it any more valid than me? Well, because it won't. I'll put in my book. Do not murder. Do yeah. not steal. And I'll be like, my religion. Right. Notice you had to borrow from the Bible to do that. I did. So simple, There's guys. So many other religions that it's have tough. do not murder and do yeah. not steal in them. Like who? Uh, the Hindu books. They borrow from Christianity. Every religion borrows from biblical Christianity. Every single one of them. Yes, it does. No. And that's your problem if you don't know that. But if you do a study you, okay, of comparative Native religion... Americans, how did they get it? Did, they, What's that? did someone just send them a Bible, like, way back? They just got a Bible somehow? No, they, they were... up on the shore, and they were like, oh, we're going to spread this shit. And they, like, took it? No, sir, but they were they, they had a conscience exactly like the Bible says they would. And when we found American Indians... And they Indians, knew murder was wrong. So that's they, right, they exactly. They could have written a exactly book that said murder like, was wrong. That's right, exactly like the Bible said they would. They know stealing is wrong, they know murder is wrong, they know dishonoring your parents was so wrong. The they already knew, they already the knew, they already knew inherently by conscience exactly what Romans chapter 2 said they would know. And so it proves the Bible, it doesn't disprove the Bible, sir, sorry. That's a cop-out. It's not a cop-out. You're saying because... But then again, if you don't have, but then again, if you don't have a proper epistemology, you're right in that you should be able to interpret any line of evidence. I could present you the greatest evidence in the world, but because you don't have an epistemological certainty, you could look at it and go, well, I don't know if I'm looking at that for certain. Maybe well, I'm, maybe, maybe I'm hallucinating. If we both brought your religious text and my made up one, what makes yours more important other than just the years and the power behind your religion? Well, you, would prove, more valid? well you would prove mine the minute you brought your, yours forth because you would show that you depend on mine in yeah, order I don't to depend on yours. You, you just said the first thing out of your book would be that you shall not steal. <laughs> yeah. You should not murder. I mean, you're borrowing from the Ten Commandments, bro. You should have done better. You should have come up with a commandment for the spaghetti monster or something. But you came up with a Ten Commandments because you know that you need the golden rule to even... Before you can even start talking about morality, you, you have to presuppose biblical principles. Everybody does. You live like a Christian every day of your life. Every day of your life, you live like a Christian. When you buy something from the store, you live by God's commandments. You shall not steal. If that cashier... No, I live by the economy and what controls our society. That's right. And you want the economy to be fair. You want the economy not to steal from you. You that's want the economy to honor you. Religion. Yeah, that's right. And that logic better be based on absolute logic that's not self-refuting, not self-contradictory, that abides by the law of, of identity, the law no, of no, non-contradiction. No, Bible is yeah. mirroring... Society. Society's no, not sir. mirroring your Bible. No, you're wrong about that. That's a cop-out. No. no. No, sir. It's called historical precedent. And how come people did it before they even saw what a Bible was? You can't just say, oh, because they were inspired by a spirit right. that was in me. It's a historical a precedent argument, sir. It's very simple. We have the historical precedent because society goes back to the first man. You may not like that. You may not like, like the answer. But because you're not a Christian, I don't expect you to like the answer. I expect you to do exactly what the Bible says, which is to, which is to reject your Creator and to live contrary to His law, 
because you haven't humbled yourself to the point that you're willing to repent of your sin and embrace His Word and embrace His law and embrace Jesus Christ who died on the cross and rose again. Of course, when you're an enemy of God and you hate God through wicked works, I don't expect you to receive anything that God has to say. I mean, I didn't. For 18 years, 19 years of my life, I was not raised in a Christian home and I couldn't stand religion or Christianity. I didn't go to church. I thought church was the stupidest thing in the whole world. I thought, what do you want to go to church for? You can go to a party. So you have to have a heart change to know the truth. And that's what the Bible says. Repent and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I don't feel like we're ever going to reach an illness debate because I disagree. I don't know how you know anything without God. The reason... You still, you still show me. Bad is I asked you. I asked you how you knew anything, anything, without God, and what you told me was, I know things. That's called begging the question. You haven't answered the question. You're begging the question. You see what I'm saying? You're kicking the can down the street, but you're not actually getting anywhere. Well, yours is just making up fake answers. No, hold on. Any better. No, hold on a second. Now you're already making knowledge claims. So I'm asking you how you know anything at all for certain. Because he's a giant spaghetti god, and he created all of us, and I So this him. proves my point every single time I'm out here. When I ask students to validate their epistemology, the best that they can do is they become sarcastic, and they appeal to the flying spaghetti monster. Okay, go for it. But you know what the Bible says? You will not be happy in the end. Because the Bible says, consider your end, well, and what it will be. Well, god says that you will also not be happy in the end. That's right, so you can live by his revelation and perish. Any, any other questions? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, of course. I always come here. Whenever I see you here, I come and I want to talk to you because I like your perspective. No, but, um, you like my perspective? Yeah, I mean, I don't care okay. whether you're a Christian or not. I just want right, to see right, what right. you say. Okay. It's, it's very interesting. Yes, sir. So, yeah. I mean, for me, creation is like a big I don't issue. like your perspective, but I like you. Okay. You're a cool guy, but Thanks. I don't That's like true. your perspective, but... It's okay. I mean, like, we can still have a opposite, right? conversation. kind of the opposite, right? All right. Yeah. So, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, God created us in his image. Right? And in talking to other people, that's not like, you know, God himself has a head, hands, and two feet, right? God, well, is that, help me understand that, I guess. What does it mean to be created in God's image? Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Well, to be created in the image of God means that we are like God in many ways. Okay. For example, if you read on in the book of Genesis, what you're talking about is Genesis chapter 1, sure. verse 26 and 27. If you read on in the book of Genesis, it also says that, that people beget sons and daughters in their image. Okay. It uses the same Hebrew word. Right. And so what it just means is that we are like God in many ways, like this. Because God is rational, we are rational. Because God is moral, we are moral. Because God is, uh, uh, you know, he's cognitive, we have cognitive faculties. All of these things, right? Every quality that we have as humans, God also shares? I would say it's the opposite. The analogy works the opposite way. Okay. Because God is a moral, rational creature, so will we be. He is a relational creature, so we too will be okay. relational beings. And in that sense, we are like God in many ways. Of course, we are not like God in the sense that we are little gods, right? right, right. That's we not that's not what it means to be in the image of God. But it also means that because we are in God's image, we have great worth okay. and value and dignity. If we're not created in the image of God, and if you have a secular worldview, like my friend here earlier, if you have a secular worldview, then man really has no inherent meaning, and there's no inherent purpose to life. Why is, I mean, like, okay, that's, well, what that's is just like a problem, right? Like, not being yeah, like, if you don't believe you're created in the image of God, I mean, you can take life in the womb and kill it. Yeah. Why not? It's, there's nothing in there to value. Right. I mean, yeah. Like, if it's just matter in motion, if it's just, you know, a combination of molecules, I mean, who cares, right? What's the difference between a tomato and a newborn baby? Why can't you smash both of them equally on the sidewalk? Well, not Why do we ascribe like, meaning to one, like, but you know, not to the other? Okay, you see what I'm saying? We're not here about my opinion. We're trying to get a better I saw a YouTube video, with, or, or a Facebook video, a girl was going to the abortion clinic. She was, I don't know how many months pregnant, right. and she was dancing and talking about, I'm going to go kill this. I mean, okay. I, I don't know why Because that, her worldview, she does not believe that that person, number one, is a person. Number two, is created in the image of God. And so she's like, woo-hoo, I'm going to go kill yeah. this yeah. on the way. And they're putting that up on social media. This is our culture because of secularism. Mm, life without God leads to things like that. Every of course. time? Every time. Okay. 
Um, so. But she has a conscience. Just, well. Regardless of what she says. I mean, that's like a subjective sort of thing, but again, I'm not here to debate that. Um, so. And we can ask all our questions until we're blue in the face. Yeah, the I mean, reality I, is, again, I'm you know, help you the smartest you person, know. think about this, the smartest person that ever walked the face of the earth, Jesus Christ. Okay. He came, and when he spoke to humanity, he didn't hand us a big fat manual on quantum physics or epistemology or philosophy. Sure. He told the crowds that he was talking to, unless you become like a little child and humble yourself, by no means will you enter the kingdom of God. Okay. And so you can grind your axe away at God all you want to your blue in the face. You can you can be mad at God and rage at God and you can and you can philosophically reject God your whole life. Right. And then but perish in the end. Okay. That's right. Okay, that was just kind of a statement. Alright, cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of a preacher, so well, the argument is very simple, is that Christianity is, the message of Christianity is a crisis. This is not just an ongoing conversation. There's a point to this. You are in a crisis hour, my friend. Okay. You're not promised tomorrow. Right. And when you face God, you will go to heaven or hell. And the Bible says you would be judged according to your works. Right. And the Bible says that on the final day, he, he will open up all the books that contain all the deeds of everyone who has ever lived, sure. and He will judge us out of everything contained in the books. God who is omniscient, that's effortless for Him, right. right, to recall the data banks of every single human being that's ever lived. And you will go either to eternal hell or heaven. But the actions themselves are rendered completely useless unless I am a Christian. So if I live, like say, He and I are both dead, right? Um, he's a Christian. No, oh, no. Let's like let's make me the Christian because I'll put the bad things on my side. Right? This guy's a non-Christian. He's lived his life pretty well. He's been a great person. He's lived his life as well. He's been in blocks. He does everything. Okay. He does every not not everything. Right? Not every single thing. But he's a good, well-intentioned human who's lived a great life. I'm a Christian. Right? Um, for whatever reason, I decided that I wanted to kill three people every other year for whatever reason. Right? I reached and like every yeah. time I killed somebody, every time I killed somebody, I looked in my heart and I said, God, I hate that I did that. That is the worst thing I've ever done. I repent and I want to live in your glory. And I live in his glory for like three months. And then the urge comes back and I kill somebody again. And then so now we're both dead. Yeah. I'm a Christian. I've believed in God my whole life. Do I because I repented from every single one of those sins go to hell? And because he never chose to believe in God in the first place, does he go to hell? Sorry to tell you your entire yeah, I'm sorry to tell you, your entire analogy is fallacious. Okay. Because there's no such thing as a good person. You said he's a good person. There is no such thing as a good person, sir. No. Oh, so we can't even Romans even chapter that. 3 says there is no one good, not even one. Okay. Everyone has sought their own way. Another one, everyone wants to be autonomous. Everyone wants self. Yeah, Everybody wants to do their own thing. And no one wants to subject themselves to the law of God. Our minds are not even able to do so. We're so wicked. We don't want to subject ourselves to God's law. See? So there is no good people, so number it, one. Number two, and then the way that you described Christianity to me would suggest that your Christianity is suspect. Because what you're saying is, what you're saying is that, <laughs> what you're saying is that you can profess Christianity, but you can be a serial murderer. I mean, sir, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. The Bible says you have to have proof of fitting repentance. You have a, Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. If, you, if this person is professing godliness, and then they're become, and, but yet they're living as a serial murderer, I don't think we can take your profession well, I mean, of faith very serious. The only, the only thing that I did wrong was killing the person, right? That's the only thing that's really a bad thing in God. Murder. I go to church, murder, right? Yeah. So I murdered a person, right? But you said for every instance of, I guess, sin, if you're a Christian, if you truly believe, then you can repent, and God will absolve you of that sin. If I'm understanding it correctly, you, I'm a Christian, I have God in my heart, I believe, and I commit this sin, and every time I commit this sin, I repent with the deepest sort of internal repentance possible. And I'm good for a while, and then something happens in my life, like God sends me a... If you genuinely repented, then you would be saved. Right. If you genuinely repented, then you would live in obedience to God's word, and you would no longer be a serial murderer. 
I mean, I, I don't know what's Austin's so hard about that. I thought Austin's were like equal, right? As long as you repent. They are in one sense, but they're not in another, sir. So that's one of the things that I have trouble understanding. And yeah, I, in I one sense, know. every sin is equal. In another sense, the Bible talks about that some some sins are much worse than other sins. We know that. Well, I, mean, I talked I, about this before. Yeah, no, Even in our justice system, we have a depravity scale. It depends how you did something that will determine your punishment. If you murdered someone, you will get less of a of a penalty of a of a judgment than if you murdered that person, took their body, chopped it into pieces, burned it alive, you know, buried it. You will get a much stricter judgment because of the way that you did it. That is the law of man. Right? And so, in the what same way, well, it's analogous. It's a, it, re it reflects, I think, God's justice system. But like, even Jesus talked about that. Like one marriage, sin, so one I, I sin is enough to connection between human law and God's law kind of intersect. Or yeah, well, are they just selectively applicable? Depending one on the sin is enough to send you to hell. Right. But depending on the type of sin that you commit will determine your punishment in hell. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus taught. Cool. That's all. Well, he talks about it in the Gospels that some will be punished with many stripes as compared to others. You have a question for me? Yes, sir. So, real quick, we're almost there? Almost. You said four, right? Yeah, it's 310 right now. Yeah. You have a question for me? First question, eh? My name is Joe. My name is Emilio. Emilio. You can lift that microphone to yourself. Are you? Are no, you? no, no. Keep it on the thing, but I'm just saying move it so that. Are you a Are you a pastor? I am. You, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I got a question for you. I've been going to church since I was like young and stuff. So really, I've been wondering this for a long time. Yep. You probably heard it before. But can you explain to me how? I mean, God's supposed to be all knowing, right? And He created mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm trying not to litter over here. Yeah. So if uh, he knows what's gonna happen, right? Yeah. And you set all these goals in our heart, or however you want to describe it, then how can free will really be a thing if what he knows is supposed to happen is gonna happen? Regardless? I don't believe in free will. Uh, so you know platonically what? defined. No. I don't believe in the autonomous free will, meaning we we are free and completely independent of the Creator's sovereignty. Absolutely not. So you don't think Bible? That's true? No, of course not. There's only one person that has free will, that's God. So Everybody then, else has a will that is accordance with their nature. So then are these choices really always to make? They are true choices. We, we do make true choices. The fact that, that we're not free or independent of God, that doesn't mean that they're not free choices. Yeah, and then you will be held accountable for them too. So if you sit there and say, well, if I'm not as free as God, well then forget it that my choices are not free and therefore I'm just going to keep living in sin then you know what you can you can live that way but in the end i guarantee you won't be happy and okay, you're still accountable i understand that. yep. that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is if this choice isn't mine to make it is yours to make then how do I god know? is not the one acting out in your life in other words when you sin yeah. god is not the one sinning on your behalf you did it he didn't do it the yeah. fact that he has control over all things does not minimize your culpability in the sin okay okay yep. another question i have to these goals in my heart anybody have a any non-Christians have a question about God or the Bible? Uh, that's what the microphone is for. Yeah, it's a biblical principle. No, I just, it's, yeah. it's more personal. If I want to talk to you being a Christian, when's a good time I can speak to Off the microphone. And I'm asking, like, when? I just said it right now. Off the microphone. When? He's asking when? when? Oh, like, like, time oh just, you. I don't know. If you catch me around here off the microphone, no, come up and talk to me anytime. You're, you're, anytime. Where do, you, where do you preach at? Uh, we have a church in Frisco, Texas. What's it like? What's it called? Like specifically? Heritage and Grace is the name Heritage? of the church. Yeah. You'll be there Sunday. By God's grace. <laughs> All right, I'll be there too. All right, I'll show. You have a card or something?